Thank you very much, James, for that uh, very detailed introduction. <laughs> and uh, before I get into the nitty gritty of my talk, I would just like to express my oh goodness. Uh, I would just like to express my great, my deepest gratitude to um, SCR, the people here at SCR who made this into a very um, intellectually fostering place where you know, scholars like myself can uh, go into academic endeavors such as the one that you'll see today. I'd also like to thank my fellow scholars here or just a, a very intellectually stimulating environment, and I hope we will enjoy each other's company in the weeks to come. Okay, so uh, the project I'm currently working on uh, at this point in time is called Complexities of Negotiating Cultural and Linguistic uh, Identities Online in Balinese. Now, let me give you a little bit of prior context or prior text if you want to go the Pete Becker's way of doing things. So as James mentioned, I did start off as uh, studying Indonesian music and dance for about 20 years. Uh, but there was one thing that sort of was sort of perplexing to me, um, how to make an academic career out of that. Uh, well, a lot, you have a lot of ethnomusicologists uh, nowadays, but my one fear was I had a great dislike of Western staff notation. So I decided not to go into uh, music. Instead, uh, even after uh, just rehearsing and performing with fellow musicians and learning from these teachers, a big part of it was language. Okay, so uh, I decided to pursue uh, the language spoken in these areas where these performing arts came from. So, uh, to make a long story short, this is what I studied for my dissertation. So this is a traditional village council meeting called the Sanka Banda, and it involves basically the uh, household head, the heads of household, in any typical Balinese hamlet, which is called the Banda. And in this hamlet, um, major decisions about the village, okay, what did they build, you know, what were they going to do, what were their activities going to be, were decided. They were decided by consensus. Okay, so I decided to take a look at the language, just how formulaic the language was that these people used in these meetings. And actually, I saw that they used a combination of ritualized language, so language that they would repeat over and over again so that they came up with certain linguistic formulae for addressing the public or the other uh, uh, heads of household in these meetings. Uh, the other component to that was that they did, uh, they actually used some expressions used in ritual, okay, so uh, sanctified expressions, expressions that you would expect to see in uh, prayers, ceremonies, and the like. Okay, so uh, so this was one venue that I looked at this, at ritualized and ritual language as a part of a toolkit, a linguistic toolkit for uh, building up and supporting and asserting a, uh, a cultural identity, a Balinese identity. So today, one of the questions I wanted to address in this project is uh, what are other possible venues where people can establish both linguistic and cultural identities? Secondly, how would one go about the process in these other contexts? Okay, so obviously, yeah, if you've read the title at least, <laughs> this other context, another context would be online. Okay? So the purpose of this talk, I'm going to be discussing for, uh, about the four 
formation of linguistic identities online embodies in two ways. Okay. The first way is through creative but phonetically informed. So phonetically informed, for those of you who are not linguists, this means that it's prompted by a sound change, a regular sound change in language. Uh, so it's a creative use of orthography. Uh, and second of all, the use of ritual language, as per Dubois 1986, in non-ritual or non-religious contexts online. Okay. So, to put it in a, in a deeper way, okay, so this use of orthographic alternations in ritual language, I'm taking this, I'm taking these two strategies as indexes of a distinct yet reimagined Balinese identity. Okay, why reimagined? Well, in recent years, this reimagination uh, is directly influenced by Ajibari. Okay, so this is a cultural self-awareness campaign from 2003. I'm going to get into a little more detail about this, but basically what you need to know at this point is that Ajibari was a, one of the direct responses to the 2002 bombings in the uh, resort towns of Kuta. Uh, Kuta and Jimbara, I believe. Uh, but mainly Kuta. Okay, uh, furthermore, online technologies can aid in the formation and preservation of cultural linguistic identities. We've all heard about these apocalyptic statements about globalization, modernization, you know, they're all going to wipe out indigenous cultures. Well, I'm sh showing that in this case, there are plenty of cases, including this one, where you can use these online technologies to aid in these, uh, in these uh, traditional indigenous identities. Okay. However, I'm going, to, I'm going to give you a proviso that this is all dependent on the degree of creativity that uh, for people to address the complexities of forming, okay, forming, forming an identity, and sometimes reimagining and preserving these identities. So this is where the complexity comes in. Why online sources? Okay, why is this such a rich source for data? And especially in studies like this one. Okay, um, now for people, for people to uh, sort of create these linguistic identities, one only needs access to a computer with internet access. Okay, and you don't even need to own one, and especially in Indonesia, Indonesians don't earn too much, so the majority of them don't own computers, but they have another resource. Okay, access to WadNet. Okay, so uh, basically a short form for wide internet. So these are public internet cafes that, for a nominal fee, the uh, people users can go online. They can fiddle around. They can play games or whatever, but. A lot of them like to go online, they like to chat, they like to go on uh, Facebook, they like to do other things on the internet. So they have this resource for those who don't have computers. Okay. Linguistically speaking, the priority for these users is to communicate. Okay, just get your message across. Uh, not to represent language as it should be. Okay, so you have abbreviations, truncations, you have alternate spellings of all sorts. Uh, so, basically, being online, communicating online, you just need efficiency, and therefore, people can get really creative um, uh, on how they can represent their language. Now, uh, this, as I've already said, or as I've already said, you have a great degree of creativity of linguistic representation possible. Okay, so, Again, the spelling with uh, using certain symbols, using certain convention, uh, other uh, well written conventions. Okay, uh, people can be really creative with this and still get their messages through. 
Okay, so uh, let me give you a little bit about Bollies. For those of you who have been to Bali before and were wondering what the drivers were talking, you know, when they were being driven around the island, uh, I would guarantee that that was not Balinese, unless there was another Balinese person inside. Okay, whatever you were taught, that was Indonesian. Okay, so um, if you don't know where Bali is, it's within Indonesia, it's within the Republic of Indonesia, and maybe it's a little bit difficult to point it out on this type of map. So here's a clue. <laughs> Okay, it's this tiny speck, okay, about the size of Rhode Island. Here it is upon closer view. Okay? So uh, to the west you have Java, okay, one of the densest, pop densely populated islands in the world. And then to its east you have Lombok. Okay? Um, I did most of my field work uh, just north of the Denpasar area, an area called Ubud. Uh, the county or the regency of Gyanyar. Okay, so with Balinese, it's an Austronesian language, so that means it's related to Tagalog and Hawaiian and uh, all the Polynesian languages, uh, most of the languages spoken in Indonesia, uh, and virtually all the languages spoken in the Philippines. Okay, so it's Austronesian, but its sub-branching is something that has very recently come up. I always used to know this sub-branching as Sundic, S-U-N-D-I-C. But now, according to the 16th edition of the SIL Ethnologue, it's under it's it's classified under the Malayo Sumbawan sub-branch. So in this sub-branch, you also have languages like Sudanese spoken in West Java, uh, you have Malay, Malay Indonesian, and other languages. Uh, and but the Main exclusion is Javanese, a neighboring language. Okay, so this is going to figure in uh, later on in the talk. Uh, so it's spoken primarily on the island of Bali, but also in transmigrant communities in Lombok and Sulawesi. So the neighboring island of Lombok, and then there is a really uh, interesting looking island called Sulawesi. You might know uh, this island as the Celebes. Okay, so this is its modern name now. And it's spoken by over 3.3 million speakers, according to the 2000 census. Uh, it's not endangered, but there are trends that suggest that it might become threatened, at least within the next 10 to 20 years. If you want more of an explanation, I'd be happy to address those questions during the Q&A. Now, Balinese is famous for its socially stratified speech styles after Arrington 1988. Okay, so speech styles, what do I mean by speech styles? Basically for Balinese, these are mainly multiple layers in the lexicon, and these layers are used depending on what uh, castes or social levels your addressees on, uh, are on, and then uh, that is vis-a-vis -vis your own position, your own caste. So, for some, if I'm talking to someone of a lower caste, I would use one uh, speech style. If I were talking to someone of a higher caste, I would use a high speech style. I would use another. This is different from register, because register depends on formality. Uh, this is on a different plane altogether. Okay, so we have a, an illustration of speech styles in Balinese. These three sentences, so you have the high, medium, and low versions, and these all mean, are you going to take a bath? And uh, believe it or not, this is a very common question. Uh, Bali, especially in Bali, but all throughout Indonesia, people will ask you, uh, will you take a bath, or have you taken a bath, and it's a, it's a bit of a greeting. So the high version, you have, Nabi Ratu Jaki Masujian, okay, so you would ask this to a high priest, who apparently hasn't taken a bath yet. Um, now the medium is for a stranger, okay, medium level, uh, medium speech style is for a person about 
uh, whom you don't know his or her caste. Okay, so you could ask uh, the medium question, Okay, and then Lo is just with one, uh, just with a person of an equal caste or lower caste. Okay, so you could say, Apochai Kalmangus or Aponyai Kalmangus. Okay, Chai and Yai, the differences between masculine and feminine. Alright, so the high and medium levels, high and medium speech styles, obviously share some words, so such as what, which is Napi, and then the future marker, which is Jaki. So another way people like to divide this is for the high and medium levels, uh, people call this alus, these two speech styles, alus, which means refined. Okay, so some refined or, uh, yeah, soft and refined. The low speech style is known as biasa, which means regular or normal. There are other speech styles which range from the, let's say, ultra alus, okay, that this is what you say to a priest when he is officiating some ceremony versus, uh, let's see, a speech style that you would use to curse someone out or call them an animal. So there, there, there are more complexities to these speech styles, but people usually classify them into either the three categories, high, medium, low, or Agus versus Biasa. So before going on to the next slide, I'm just going to have a sonic example of Basabari uh, Biasa. So this is the uh, the low level. Okay, this is uh, an example of low level language. Okay, so this is taken from a folk tale, someone rendering a folk tale to a child. Um, I just want you to get a, sort of a feeling of the sound of uh, normal, of biasa qualities, normal qualities, versus the next clip which you'll hear, which is of refined qualities. And this is taken from a recording uh, from one of my uh, council meetings that I recorded for my dissertation. So this is Basavali uh, Alus. Okay, um, just glancing at the two examples, you notice that the words seem really different from each other. And uh, this is basically because of these, uh, these speech styles. You have replacements of vocabulary all over the place. Okay, so going on. Uh, the data that I'm using for uh, this project, so I'm using basically three sources of data online. Okay, so the first one, uh, first set of data comes from entries from users of public walls on Facebook. So if you don't know, if, if you don't have a Facebook account, you don't know what a public wall is. This is basically a space where you and your friends, okay, your, your Facebook friends, quote unquote, uh, can't put entries, they can write anything on your wall. Uh, most people elect to have a public wall, some other users don't elect to have a public wall, they just post things up at, uh, you know, from their end, but they don't allow their friends to post anything. So, um, so these walls, um, the users themselves can comment on their own walls, uh, and then it's just an option for them whether they want to let their friends uh, comment on these walls. So we have a uh, sort of a typical 
uh, entry here from DKA using, using DKA speaking in Balinese. This is a joke about uh, just the chicken being uh, taken by a dog, and then uh, it's, it's, an, it's an allusion to something else. SL gives some very uh, clever responses to this. Okay, but why Facebook? Well, uh, the current figures for Facebook use in Indonesia, there are 35 million users of Facebook in Indonesia. This is number two in the world, uh, after the US. UK is third, okay? Now this is a little bit misleading because this is only 15% of the population of Indonesia. Indonesia is a very populous country. So, um, you know, you have to take that figure with a grain of salt. But, uh, the average age for uh, users is uh, 23, so 23 years old. This is your average age of your typical user of Facebook in Indonesia. Um, now, uh, I could leave you with these figures, but I'm going to leave you with something else, something more anecdotal. So this next slide has uh, sort of illustrates the far-reaching popular popularity of Facebook in Bali. Okay, this is a T-shirt, a T-shirt making fun of the name Facebook. Okay, and instead of Facebook, it's Facebook. Okay, Facebook Bali. So Bok means older sister. It's usually um, if you want to get intimate, but if you're not intimate with someone yet, you usually call uh, if you're. If you're looking for a particular person, you would call this potential romantic partner Bob. Okay, so uh, this is a, this was on a T-shirt that came out last year, and I don't know if you can see this. So first of all, they changed the name of Facebook to Facebook. So they kept they kept the uh, B O O K. They just added an M. Okay, and then this text up here says. Facebook membantu anda untuk berhubungan dengan blog-blog yang ada di Bali. So Facebook can help you connect with the young ladies that are here in Bali. And then finally says, siapa tahu dapat jodoh? Who knows? You might find someone. <laughs> so over here you have blog made, blog nyoman, blog kontren, blog ketut, blog putu. So this is also playing into uh, another Balinese stereotype is that, which is that Balinese men are quite womanizing. Okay, so I can also talk about that a little bit later <laughs> on. <laughs> okay, another set of data. Okay, we have guestbook entries on the website for Tenban Bali, which is on uh, the Bali TVs, this very local TV station. And Tamang Bali is a show which features uh, local talent, local singing talent, usually through pop, Bali pop videos. Okay, so people can go on to here, they can go on the guestbook, they can request songs or, or do, uh, do, any other, uh, do something else. Uh, the third source of data is basically a Balinese language thread on Kaskus. Okay, so this is an internet forum slash community with primarily Indonesian membership. And I've given you a handout with uh, this information on. Okay, so this is taken from the first page of this particular thread. Okay, so this is the um, well, you're about to enter onto a Balinese language thread, okay? And it says, uh, welcome, this is a uh, forum uh, for our traditional village. So they're invoking the traditional village, Banjaradat, Mabasa Bali, Rinkaskus, Regional Bali. So where you speak Balinese for our regional Kaskus thread. Okay, and uh, the first rule Okay, number one, Wajik Nangen Basavali, is you must use Balinese. So this is the first rule of this thread, and so everything is basically in Balinese afterwards. Okay, 
So you can uh, peruse this, uh, uh, this little page and its translation. Okay. So I just want to highlight a few things here. So we, uh, there's also this little line at the end. Um, so there is this word Ajahn again, which uh, I'll talk about more about Ajahn Bali later on. But this is tied into this uh, Ajahn Bali uh, campaign. Now uh, we're going to get into some drier area uh, here orthography, aka spelling. Okay, so just think back to grammar school. Oh goodness, spelling. Right? Okay, so but orthography. Um, basically, it's a system of representing language through written form. Okay. The goal of orthography is to capture sounds of language through discrete symbols. Okay, so anything that has a writing system, uh, you have to uh, capture the sounds of a language. This is different from logographic uh, characters, typical of Chinese and other uh, such writing systems. Now, uh, Cahill and Kara in 2008 said that, uh, well, this is what you included in orthography. Relative well, placement of these symbols, word breaks, punctuation, diacritics, capitalization, hyphenation, and other aspects which might be regula regulated in a written standard. So you have a written standard, and then you have all these other considerations to think about when you form an orthography, when you form a spelling system. Cahill, very recently, said that all orthographies are political. Okay, so what did he exactly mean by this? Well, you have a choice. Uh, it's, not, it's rarely going to be a one-to-one -one representation. How are you going to represent your language, the sounds of your language? So there's obviously a lot of uh, decision making, a lot of, uh, I would say, a lot of compromise uh, on the part of the developers of these orthographic systems. Okay, so going on to Balinese orthography. Now, Balinese used to be written with a Brahmi-based script, so this means a South India, so it's an Indic script. Okay, and its um, traditional Balinese script is an Abugida. So these are graphemes or letters. Okay, you can think of these as letters that stand for syllables. Okay, and each syllable, each written letter, has an inherent vowel. That's just, it's unstated, it's considered as neutral. So in Balinese, that neutral vowel, that inherent vowel is ah. So this is the Balinese script shown in its traditional order. Okay, so, uh, so you have A's everywhere. These are, this is the this is the unmarked uh, version of these letters. Now, with Balinese orthography, it's now mostly rendered in the Roman alphabet. Uh, people learn of Aksara Bali, this Balinese alphabet, or Tulisan Bali, Balinese writing, in elementary school, but they soon forget it afterwards. And uh, to this day, it's restricted to religious and ritual texts. So you'll find most Balinese script there. You have people who specialize in reading uh, these scripts. So uh, not every not every Balinese can do it. In fact, probably only about five percent of the population can read uh, Balinese script comfortably. Now, one of the things that makes Balinese orthography uh, a bit mind-boggling is that, okay, what do you do if you want to change the vowel? So you have these characters with an inherent vowel, you have the inherent vowel ah. What do you what do you need to do? Well, you need to add secondary diacritics. So let's take our first letter here, h or uh. Okay. And you add the 
these various diacritics. So first one, ulu, you have this thing on top. This makes it into an e. Okay. Suku, you have this thing on the bottom. It changes the this sound to an u. Okay. Tale, okay, you have this thing in front of the consonant. That means you pronounce it as a. Uh, but which is sort of a schwa vowel, a uh, sound. You have this thing on top, and it tells you to pronounce it as a. Uh. And then finally, taling tudung, you have this thing on uh, sort of the taling in front, and also an extension of the character in the back. That tells you to pronounce the character o. Okay, so what I want you to pay special attention to are these two, taling, okay, with an a, and then puppet. Now, even the names are mnemonics for how these vowels are supposed to sound. Okay. Now, in modern Balinese spelling, at first, when they romanized Balinese, uh, phonemic puppet, okay, so this, this uh sound was transcribed with just a regular e. Okay, and then the sound tale, okay, the, uh, let's see, well, the, if we go back here, tale, the one with the diacritic in front, okay, was transcribed at, with an accent e, with a, with, uh, with a acute accent. Okay, and you can see this in an example here where we have the uh, the tale marked with an accent E. Okay, this is a very recent example, and just to show you that this romanization style hasn't died out. Okay. However, uh, in most Balinese uh, writing, puppet and tale were later conflated into one graphing, into one letter, E. Okay. And what did this do? It required readers to know how words are pronounced before determining what, what has the puppa and what has the talen value. So you have E's all over the place, and unless you knew the language, you had, you had absolutely no idea how things were pronounced. Okay, now here's your phonology for the day. Okay, relevant sound change. Okay, so underlying the, the sound ah is raised to a non-low vowel. So this can range from any, anywhere between this little goat head, which is uh, and then this O-E combination, which is uh. Okay. S sounds a little bit little familiar. Hmm? So, but, uh, so you have this sound change. You have this raising in the following two environments. First, First thing off, uh, word final. Okay, so we have this in examples like bapa. Okay, bapa diange. Okay, bapa it's at the end of the word. Therefore, you have the sound change. However, in a possessive construction, you have a linking morpheme n, which blocks it. Okay, so the sound change doesn't apply. That's how we know we have an a. Ah, okay, because the sound change doesn't happen. So in my father bapa diange. The ah is preserved, it doesn't change. The second one is prefix final. So we have uh, these, uh, we have many prefixes that end in ah, typographical ah in Balinese. So one of them is a verbal uh, prefix ma, which indicates either possession or some sort of attributive quality. So you have gna, which means place, ma gna. It means to be located. Okay? With ka, we, it's another verbal prefix. It marks the passive voice, if you remember from grammar. Uh, and it's only for the other styles. So we have ichen to ask, which is the medium or high version of to ask. And then we have ka ichen, ka ichen, okay? To be asked. Okay? They're not word final, but they are prefix final. So these are two different environments. Okay, so what does this have to do with anything? You may be asking. Well, ah raising is also described as being puppet. Okay, so if you remember back to our little slide of puppet, you remember that 
Regular Rupa is marked with a special symbol. But, Ari, but this rule was never represented in the traditional Bani script. Okay, so let's take an example here. Ada, which means to exist. You would write it in traditional Bani script as Ada. Okay, so don't put any diacritics. It's not represented as Ada with the proper puppet uh, sign over it, or the, the diacritic. Okay, so you just basically had to be aware of the sound change, even if you were reading Bonnie's text. Now, representing this Papa A, okay, now we see that there is this tendency for people to, do, to substitute A with typographical E, because E is the puppet. So, we have Salam Atat Mukadam the. Okay. Magadam means to be all, all or be exclusive or inclusive. We have this prefix ma, okay, but many people are now representing it with an e. Okay. So this is the single letter sound change I was previewing the other day. Uh, same thing with suba, okay. In the traditional Bali script, it would be written with a ba with a ba syllable, but Many people are now taking this, they're, being, they're aware of the sound change, and they say, well, it sounds more like E, so we'll just write it with E. Okay, so as I said, many bodies are now representing this puppet, okay, word of prefix final A, with the grapheme E. Okay, for example, Bapa, okay, Bapa, which has the puppet pronunciation, many people are now saying, are now writing B A P E. Now it's partially motivated by an A, uh, by this A raising rule. Uh, another factor is that you have cognates from neighboring languages. Okay, so if you take a look at this column, I won't get into it that much, but I'll give you the first example. Uh, we have this uh, word A P A, which means what? In Indonesian, it would be pronounced apa. In Javanese, you have a slight change of pronunciation. It's spelled the same way, opa. And in Balinese, since you learn now you learn the A raising rule, it would be pronounced as apa. Okay, they're, they're, the pronunciation is different, but you know according to the traditional script, how, how this particular word was represent, was was represented. Um, the spelling is the same. So you sort of get a sense that, okay, they're changing the spelling maybe because they want to distinguish themselves from other languages that might spell it similarly. Okay, and then we have other examples here. Uh, I won't get into the methods that much, but for, uh, the, for these uh, two data sets, um, each token had to contain some, a little bit of Balinese, and each token had to have some instance of puppet A. Okay, so uh, out of the data that I collected so far, so I have 158 tokens for Facebook, 246 tokens for Cascos and Tenman Bali, I collected 287 tokens. Uh, this is still ongoing, I'm still in the process of looking at more uh, of these tokens. Now, the categorization of puppet A data, uh, to categorize these, I categorize them in these categories. So for each token, okay, did they have a prefix final, graphic E, a lexical final E, a prefix final A, or a lexical final A. And of course, for each token, you could, it could be categorized under more than one category, if the conditions were right. So if you had a, uh, let's see, a prefix final E and then a lexical final A, that was possible. And, it, what, and it's been tested quite a lot. Okay, so let's take a look at the results here. Now I just divided the Facebook group into users, and as you can see, there's no prevalent pattern. Okay, so the, 
One thing I wanted to illustrate here was that this switch over from A to E is not at all consistent. Okay, and depends on the user. So with N, uh, this user NKA, she basically uses, let's see, A with the uh, lexical items, so final A, but for prefix final, she uses E. Okay, so there's a clear split. But there are others who don't illustrate a, such a clear uh, split. And the proportions, there are no general trends. Okay, I can speak on the individual speakers. Um, so for NS, uh, we could say that uh, for the, basically that user uses E at the ends of regular words, but for ritual expressions, he'll veer over to preserving the A. Okay? Uh, but this doesn't hold for all speakers. Okay? Same thing for Cascus. Okay, Wayan um, basically, he has the clear separation between uh, final A, okay, final A, but using E after an affix, after a prefix. Okay, but again, the trend, there's, there's no prevailing trend here. So there's a, there's a big degree of variation in the use of using A versus E. Um, now this one, we have too many users, so I couldn't split it up to users. But we see, again, okay, we see people using a lot of Things ending with E, okay, word final E, word final A, we have 102 tokens here. And then 63, we have people who use E at the ends of prefixes. Okay, so maybe we can say one thing, okay, we can say that prefix finally, people prefer to use E. That's it, okay. So what, uh, what can we make of this? Okay, so here, here we go. Um, here's an example of inconsistency of distribution. Uh, like you could answer, uh, so we have this uh, ex um, this example. Kayan buzz nidan mabalas gen morta ha ha ha. Okay, so we have this suba, this perfective, which is spelled with an e, but we have this verb morta with the same value, with the same papa, spelled with an a. Okay, so. You have, there were several examples like this where within the same stream, people were varying their spelling. Again, another example, you're welcome. So these should be the same sound, but they're represented with a different letter. What, so what can we say so far? No overarching patterns of distribution. Okay, so as I told you before, we can't sense any patterns. For some users, the choice between A and A, A and E is not so defined, or so it seems. Okay, other factors to consider. Now, there are some strong tendencies, as I've uh, illustrated before. For some users, uh, you use E for prefix final positions and then A for word final positions, but that didn't hold true for all users. For users who both who use both E and A more finally, okay, as I, uh, for NS, for example, the user for Facebook, he apparently reserved A for ritual expressions. Okay. And then there's a stronger tendency for, to use E for, I didn't talk about this before, but uh, there's reduced or monosyllabic words. Okay, so these are all factors, but there's not really an overarching theme. Uh, the distribution. Now to go, I'm running out of time really quickly here, so ritual speech in Balinese, uh, these are typically used in religious ceremonies, prayers, and other ritual and spiritual contexts. Uh, these are all the way, otherwise called sanctified expressions. And uh, the original sources for many ritual expressions, ultimately, they're ultimately from foreign sources, mainly Sanskrit, in the language of Hinduism and Buddhism the two main religious influences in Bali. Okay. 
So for ritual speech, there's not a lot in Facebook, not a lot in Costcos, a whole lot in Tumba. Okay. Now, why is that? Well, if you take a look at this, now there are a lot, lots of users who are just using the list once or twice at most. Okay, so they're basically coming in as strangers. Now, most users produce single posts, and therefore, they it seems that they feel the need to introduce themselves, okay, to introduce themselves to the group or to the uh, the other users who, are, who might be looking up, uh, looking at this uh, guest book. Okay, introductions and other niceties necessary. <coughs> Okay, so here are the most frequent sanctified expressions. Om swastiastu, may all be well. This is Sanskrit. And it's used to greet people to a formal event, open, open a formal meeting or ceremony, or to open most prayers. Okay, the second one, suksama, which is an expression of gratitude, it literally means find, refined, or spirit. Okay, also it's from Sanskrit often combined with matur, to offer to express, so you have the typical, uh, stereotypical Bali's expression for thank you, matur suksama, okay, to express thanks. And the final one is the closing, or when you're about to leave. Om Santi 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 Om, okay, also from Sanskrit. Literally, Om Peace, 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 Om, may there be peace. You, and it's used to close ceremonies and meetings and to conclude prayers. Now, I think we have, we may not have uh, as much time, but I'll let you listen to this use of Om Sandi 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 Om. This is from a uh, prayer, very traditional prayer called Puja Tri Sandhya. So, what we're listening to is the sixth and final verse and the closing of this prayer. So this self, uh, this cultural self-awareness campaign, um, 
Hajit means to stand firm. Okay, and this was a, as I said before, a response to the 2002 bombings by Islamic fundamentalists in the resort town of Kuta. Okay, the bombings. For the Balinese people, they thought of it as a failure to address the rise of Islamic fundamentalism in Indonesia. Not only that, but also a failure to maintain Balinese as spiritual and cultural identity in the face of modernity. Okay. So they needed to, ass to assert Kabbalia, Balineseness. So there's this, uh, very, uh, it's not here, but uh, Picard, Picard 1999 talked about this quality of Balineseness, Kabbalia. We need to preserve this Kabbalia in the face of all this modern stuff that's happening to the Balinese. Okay, the goals of Ajit Bali, uh, steadfastness to a unified version of Balinese culture. Okay, so, and there's also this advocacy for a sanitized and uniform version of Balinese Hinduism. And at the same time, this, devalue, this devalues regional variation of practices and identities. Okay, sadly enough. The, other, the main thing is that it emphasizes and legitimizes Balinese versus the other. Okay, Balinese Hinduism to be exact. Okay, so what are the linguistic effect, effects of Ajitbadi? Okay, so we have the creation of neologisms, especially greetings equivalent to good morning, good afternoon, where there was not. Okay, and then also you have the extension of ritual language to be used in secular contexts. For example, answering the phone with Om Swastiastu. This did not happen when I first went there in 1994, but in 2003, everyone was doing this. Okay, creative orthography and Balinese identity uh, makes, distinct, makes Balinese distinct from both national language, of, that is Indonesian, and also neighboring languages, Javanese, where a lot of the Islamic fundamentalists came from. Okay, so they, wanted, they want to uh, distinguish themselves from those languages. Uh, the Romanization bit of it, even though Romanization happened a long time ago, rather than going back to their traditional script in order to do this, uh, keeping with Romanization sort of legitimizes linguistic currency within the, spe the sphere of rapid localization and its consumption. Ritual language, as for ritual language and Balinese identity, Balinese identity, as I said before, which means being a Balinese Hindu. Now, it's inclusive of religious and ritual language, but also at the same time, this ritual Balinese language becomes an emblematic index of Balinese identity. So, what do you do with that? You run away with it, and you expand the use of ritual language into secular context because of Kabbalah, you want to preserve Balinese, not because you want to make something sacred. Okay, so uh, that is the final word. Uh, that's why I'm going to leave it right